So, so thank you, uh, Mr. Ramdurai. Thank you, Ram, for always supporting the Eastern Himalayan Nature Nomics Forum. With your support and uh, many other content modifications, we've been able to reach the ninth Eastern Himalayan Nature Nomic Forum. And despite the COVID, we seem to have actually got an unprecedented uh, sort of request to attend uh, the offline uh, sort of deliberations of this. We, we think it's important for a person like you who's seen so many decades of uh, changes in the world, both technology and also weather-wise, if not climate, I think uh, to give your perspectives, but so zero in on some action points, which I think that we in nine years have been able to learn from our meetings and in, in uh, focus. What we actually ended up doing in short is we've ended up taking the route of rewilding the Eastern Himalayas, which means that we've actually started doing uh, plantations of natural assets. And these natural assets, we have not just done monoculture, we've taken samples from uh, sort of controlled sites of wild parts and seen that basically there are roughly 21 species that could go there of um, uh, lower, middle and canopy level pieces. So we've taken those 21 and actually tried to nurture them and rewild uh, that entire process. So it's not a question of just planting. So it's a bit tedious and has been a bit long. We have succeeded in doing and capturing uh, the imagination of communities for employment. So actually we've not only done rewilding, but also got communities to own these natural assets. Where we failed is to actually get a value and the valuation of these natural assets. And we believe there are three asset classes we can do it in. One is the valuation of nature, as is basic, as explained by, if you cut the bamboos and you sold it bare, you get a certain value. So how many bamboos would there be? Roughly 7% of our forests have bamboos there. We can plant more, but we didn't want to artificially do it. So 7% bamboos with teak and others, et cetera, would give you a certain value. Then we divided this asset class into four broad asset classes. One is food and fruit asset class. Two is medicinal asset class. Third is an asset class for household and building material, if not clothing, which is also with uh, uh, things like bamboo and softwood. And last but not least is the biodiversity element for tourism, we're saying it would be important. So each four of them have a value component just on basic. If you drop down one more, and actually you add uh, the value addition. So if we take teak or we take uh, bamboo and just basic stuff, we converted it into wood and we sold it, that's a value addition piece. So a normal bamboo of one square foot, if you got 3000 rupees, by value addition, you get at least 15,000 rupees. So, so that's really the value addition part of the component of that the asset class. So the asset class is forest. Within the asset class of forest, we've got forest and forestry for furniture. And that we've added value. Then on that value, we've said, what is what everybody's talking about? Ecosystem services. And therefore, how do you value nature capital through ecosystem services? What that means very simply, and it is really preaching to the converted, uh, to you who's actually been part of these debates very often, is that what is these services like water, air, quality, purity of air, soil? I don't think anybody has really gone into the depth of it. More importantly, nobody has actually tried to understand the value chain of the entire process of ecology. So to us, we've gone down to the basics to understand if this was a superficial valuation in the material world, the post Bretton Wood calculation, I call it, because it is just a taking basic word, converting it, it's man material and just converting it into goods and services. We, we basically feel that we have been challenged that this value if we can give, then we can borrow against it. So what we are finding is that the government don't understand from Arunachal, if we converted the whole value proposition there, we can borrow it for social dimensioning, which is we can build schools, we can build roads, we can build hospitals, and we can build, we can create employment through this, just the cutting and creating it in that three levels, you know? So I think somewhere down the line, we are missing the boat in terms of this whole valuation piece. And unless we do the valuation piece, that we uh, will not be able to either raise debt in an area where in today's world where debt is rare to get in a big way, unless you give some 
goods and services and mortgage, we believe that natural value would be able to do that for living life and actually for social services. So sorry for that long preamble, but that's where naturenomics has come so far in terms of understanding. And I thought it would be only fair I share that with you and then open it up for your kind of questions or your deliberations. So the first question would be, do you believe that ecology is definitely a very important ingredient to economics? And therefore, that economics will help just living and social well-being. And uh, to, to you and to everybody in the world, I think we need to address it. Your view, sir. First of all, uh, Rajiv, congratulations on the Ninth Eastern Himalayan Naturenomics, TM Forum 2021. It's not only carrying from the past what you have done with your team, but also absolutely at the center of everything with regard to the survival of the planet itself. Now, if you and I have been discussed a number of times, economy and ecology are convergent and they need to be treated like one entity and it cannot be one at the cost of the other. Yes. Now we also said that the existing pattern of consumption, production and growth patterns are completely unsustainable and this whole industrial revolution and the kind of degradation including the quality of life has been proven beyond doubt. You look at the pandemic and the history of pandemics itself and what COVID-19 is doing to the whole world, it's scary at the same time. It has also told us all to rethink how we live, how we eat, how we breathe, how we sustain and how you value the natural assets. I think the idea that a green valuation and a reward model it certainly takes into account the ecological parameters, can bring in a new age of development. And that's what we need to articulate to the younger population who otherwise will think that we have completely messed up the future and messed up their lives. And this was again seen by the kind of participation by the youth at the COP26 itself in Glasgow. Now the nature nomics ties all of these elements together based on what you also articulated just now. But importantly, it has to create a disruptive framework. I think a holistic rural community development at the heart of what we talk about is very key. And the optimization of the natural capital and assets must be the way we look forward to in the future. It is absolutely to be looked at in a scientific, practical, localized and actionable and a scalable framework. We talked of this framework almost 10 years ago when we decided to look at TCS along with you, look at within TCS itself. I think ecological approach to climate change action has both environmental benefits as well as the socio-economic benefits completely. I think it is also imperative that we need this for achieving a net zero in the future. I think carbon removal techniques like afforestation and reforestation, restoration of the coastal and marine habitat, soil carbon sequestration, building with biomass and so on form an indispensable part of the overall net zero solution framework and that's what Naturenomics talks about, but then you're trying to integrate it as part of the ninth Naturenomics conference itself. I think this will at least lead us to sustainable solutions, more importantly. I think uh, the partnership between the public, private, and the civil society needs to come together, and the commitments and actions must be put together completely in an aligned way. I think we want to see a very large scale impact as speed, as I believe. Various actors agree to collaborate and take advantage of their complementary capabilities. It's an intersection of the complementary capabilities of each, which brings to fruition the benefits which we see in a sustainable manner. So, in my opinion, Naturenomics 
provides us with only feasible development path to active carbon neutrality or a carbon possibility in the near future. And technology and breakthrough technology plays a very critical role in all of this. And we cannot not use technology for the scale and when it comes to nature and natural systems. I think uh, some of the technology interventions also uses manipulation of organisms and ecosystem processes, requiring decisions at the acceptable level through human interventions. So the possibilities are multiple and they will evolve, but in my opinion, the immediate action should be on, should be on a concerted action. Thank you. Thank you. So I think leading on from that, you know, there are two things which you could uh, help us to move. Is one is citizen sciences. You know, I think is absolutely critical. And not only is citizen sciences critical, that merging with technology for benefit of betterment of meaning natural values, which includes the plants and plant mechanisms. What is happening is many of the adaptation and mitigation technologies seem to be leading to degradation of soil and aquifers, say, for example, in agriculture and food. Agriculture and food is such a basic thing. If we start tampering with technology to destroy it with using adaptation and mitigation in the name of adaptation and mitigation, then I think we are in for a bigger disaster because we're still in the mode of better, brighter, faster, cheaper. You know, because if it's not better, brighter, faster, cheaper and making mass, we don't seem to be actually rewarding the stock exchanges. And the stock exchanges, unless you keep giving them a return, there is no actually end to a stock and therefore there's no incentive for the organization. So I think citizen sciences working on food and technology and working on reward mechanism for economically bound organizations, ESG apart, is something that we need to actually line up and put in a 360 degree format. Your comments. You know, when we have different conversations with people, everyone agrees that we have to move towards a green economy. I don't think there's any doubt, but then how they interpret it, how they practice <laughs> it, and how they connect things is the key. When people are facing real economic challenges, we can show it by moving to a greener economy and deliver on things people are generally, or more importantly, worried about. Now, what does the nature-based economy tell us? It generally has to improve their lives and whether they are concerned about the environment or not. And what is the positive addition it brings in to their lives? And if we cannot understand that in terms of protecting the nature, we cannot achieve the mass awareness and action with dialogues alone. So when we see the positive impact with the green practices and green business it brings to the people's lives, the importance of protecting the nature will come into fruition. Once the our natural capital, as you know, is invisible and underpinning force behind the global economy today. Healthy ecosystems and the wildlife together add high value to your global economy. And there are some numbers, an estimated 44 trillion of the global GDP of that. 87.6 per trillion depends on healthy ecosystems. Without the economic system services and the natural capital values, you would lose half of the global economy today. And the pandemic has demonstrated to us very well throughout these two years or two and a half years. I think uh, the sustenance and growth of the global economy and the environment are intertwined. And that's what we are trying to repeatedly say Nature must be at the center of all of our efforts and economic incentives and financial decisions must be aligned to promote preservation of biodiversity, which goes back to how we consume, how do we produce, how do you give the services? 
And ultimately, how do we manage our waste? We'll determine how the nature is able to cope with human development. And it has to thrive. I think the greater resilience in our global supply chains, food systems and public health systems is what this COVID-19 has shown us. There's still uncertainty is how the pandemic will unfold. There is an opportunity to accelerate all our efforts to put the nature at the center of all decision making. So the conference which are going to be the ninth one must articulate the schools, colleges, kids, and the focus and public debate must put nature at the center of everything. The valuation model for nature, which is the corporates have to recognize how sustainable it is with regard to whatever they do and how they dispose, and then a circular economy comes into play. I think there'll be different difficult choices as we transition into a nature-based economy, but I think they must appreciate people at large, the large-scale benefits and valuation models and a cleaner environment is the order of the day. Even if we visit the nature parks today, the point you made about the tea, the point you made about the bamboo, or how to make them sustainable instead of planting them, replanting them, etc. At the same time, using them when it needs to, and how it acts as a carbon sink and the carbon and the oxygen levels, the oxygen levels which are available, and the carbon being removed from the whole atmosphere and the system. But there are no clearer answer, but unless we experiment, unless we accelerate, unless we commit together, like I said, between the civil society, between the corporations, between the businesses and the government things will not change. This includes even demonstrated activities at a state level, within a panchayat level, where enough initiatives are there, how you connect them and scale them up is what I'm talking about. But valuation models have to be very clear. And disclosures on those valuation models by the corporations or by the government in whichever activity they are involved in must be very visible to the communities at large the community participation has to be a way of life rather than the end product which is of no use to them. That's the way I would summarize. That's very well put, you know, when you speak, and I think of the book that you wrote on TCS, it resonates very well on two parts. Now that I have also been associated with you on the skills front, there are two big horizons that you opened up for mankind, if not for India, if not for technology. One is the whole technology revolution, which they had to embrace. So you're almost saying the new revolution of ecological revolution must be embraced. We must understand the components and the benefits. The second one is on skills. So if the schools, colleges, et cetera, don't address the new requirement of skills, as over the last 30 years you've seen, to, to have a computer now is not a luxury. To have a computer now is a necessity. But when you started, not even the school teacher, uh, let alone the principal, actually knew how to use a Gmail or an email. So I think that transition that you have seen and brought about for the better betterment of for human beings through this technological revolution and embracement is really what you're saying, both from your experience in skills and the wisdom you imparted in technology. I think the merger of those two is actually what we really need for nature. Over to you reactions of. Hmm. See, even when I was managing TCS as the CEO and MD, we adopted sustainable practices and technologies on several fronts, which uh, the things like energy saving data centers or environment friendly facilities or efficient waste and water management systems. So this was started during that period. And TCS has been supply, I mean, successful in playing a leadership in what we called as IT for green. Now, in my book, The TCS Story, which you also mentioned about, which was almost published a decade ago, I had mentioned that it is inevitable that we change our economic evaluation models, where we move from financial competitiveness to ecological competitiveness, 
if you are to save the planet for the future generations. This was articulated almost a decade ago by me. Now, when you look at the jobs which are going to be in the green arena, and I try to map some of the jobs that are going to be relevant at scale level, it's not that the jobs are going to disappear with the current way of uh, production and consumption. Every industry, if you look at it, we need to reskill the workforce to design, monitor, and advocate them. And as many nations pledge to reduce or eliminate carbon emissions, the kind of jobs are, for example, clean energy experts, wind turbine, solar panel, hydropower technicians, electric vehicle workers, new plastic designers and engineers, urban farmers, forest fire inspectors and prevention specialists, environment specialists and educators, green building retrofitters, recycling of workers, waste management experts, water resources engineers, environmental managers and compliance officers and so on. So I can go on and on. And these are the kind of opportunities that are going to be thrown up in the new skills arena. Similarly, the entrepreneurial churn in emerging say, areas such as meteorology, environmental science, geophysics, marine renewable energy, hydrogen and fuel cell engineering, nuclear safety, radioactive waste management, microgrid, biochemical engineering, synthetic biology. These are all the new emerging areas where there's an opportunity. So the green skills will ultimately go back to basics. They will be nature-centered, human-focused, technology-driven, will harness the full potential of natural capital, and of course, human ingenuity to deliver novel sustainable businesses and entrepreneurship in a big way. I think when, I think you're also in your conference touching upon the green transition for a country like ours will involve five sectors or impact in the future, energy, mobility, industry, green buildings, and agriculture that contribute most of the GHG emissions. So India's path to decarbonization will have an economic impact of about 15 trillion by 2070. So that is the potential and that's the kind of job, the skills, and the capability to transition ourselves to a carbon-free net zero economy with benefit for all and protection of the nature and protection of the planet the end of the day. India can take a leading role. No, absolutely. I think uh, your, your wisdom and experience, both in technology, skills, merging it and displaying it with the recommendation for the future, highlighting how both of them merged will have such a great impact on employment through actually rural mechanism without actually having more urban areas with just a rural delivery with a better life in the rural uh, area both for healthcare and education will be the way forward. We look forward to your participating uh, through the conference. I wish I could I could spend more time with you learning and actually recording all your thoughts, which I think I will now do. We have a plan to do two things. One is to create a, a book. It's called The Natural Wealth of Nations. Actually, what Adam Smith did was created The Wealth of Nations. But nobody has actually talked about what is the natural wealth of nations. So the natural wealth of nations is the new launch of uh, the concept that uh, we in Badipara Foundation want to do, where we evaluate exactly all the points you did, but putting numbers, figures, uh, in terms of both human intervention and otherwise. The other book that we are wanting to do is the value chain of ecology. And actually ecology starts, starts with the Big Bang Theory and actually moves on to the earth and then we actually forget that there is a geological aspect. Based on the geological aspect, there is a zoological aspect. Based on the zoological aspect, there's a geographical and historical, but more importantly, an anthropological aspect. And then comes you know, economic sciences and environmental sciences. But that value chain, whenever we're doing ecology now, we're finding in replanting that we're finding soil structures are changing. And over 20 years, if not over 2000 years, which you don't have a map, but with maps we're finding has changed so radically, the trees are not relevant anymore there because it's like the prehistoric rhino. That's not a relevant thing. They're kept like in a zoo. You know what I mean? That relevance of grasslands is not there. 
So I think relevance and value chain of ecology is the other book that we want to do. And we will come to you for even more uh, thoughts, ideas, so that we leave a better thinking process, if not a doing process for the world. Thank you, Ram, again for your advice and guidance. But if you want to say anything before we close down. Only in closing, what I would like to say, Ranji, is what you are doing as part of the Balibhara Foundation is far ahead of its times. And people are beginning to realize even a small initiative which started nine years ago today is at the center of everything which we talk about. What I mean by that is action on the ground and what you people have demonstrated has never waited for government policies. It has happened in spite of the government. The policies have invariably followed. The leadership in sustainability can be achieved by implementing action on the ground and not waiting on policy. And you do it and we all do it because of our collective responsibility which we believe in. All the very best. And I'm looking forward to the ninth Nature Knowledge Conference. Thank you so much.